Hello and welcome to our online worship. It's good to join together in the Lord's name uh, and it's good to be uh, coming under God's word and singing his praise, isn't it? And increasing our devotion to the Lord. Um, it's good to join together online. It's good to join together in person as well. Uh, maybe if you're maybe getting a little bit used to these videos and want to come back to church, it'd be a good, good thing to do as well. But we keep on doing these um, services online so that people who maybe can't get out so well, uh, then this is a help for them. But it's good to join together. And that's the important thing, isn't it? It's good to bring our prayers and worship to Almighty God. And we're going to sing our first hymn, Lord, for the years your love has kept and guided. put behind us for the future takers. We pray that that will be the truth for our own lives. Our Bible reading today is from Exodus as we travel through the whole of the Bible in seven weeks. Uh, we had God who is creator and the covenant maker last week. Uh, today we're going to have God 
who is the God of freedom and the God of care. Two readings, quite long readings today, so I'll, I'll crack on with them. Exodus 12 and Exodus 20. Exodus 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of the year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of the month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, each for his household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with the nearest neighbour, having taken into account the number of people there. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the fourteenth day of the month, when all members of the community of Israel will slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. They that, that same night they are to eat meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs and the internal organs. Don't leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you'll burn it. This is how you are to eat, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. Eat in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and, and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will come to touch you when I stri strike Egypt. And Exodus 20. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself any image of the form of anything in heaven or above, or on earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do, not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is them, in, in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honour your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land of the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife, or his male or female servant, or an ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbour. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me say a prayer. Lord God, as we continue to look through the big picture of the Bible, we pray that you would speak to us and enable us to see the wonder, wonderful themes that are there, that go through the whole of the scriptures and how you work in, in Bible history and also today. Lord, speak to us and encourage us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I went to a conference a few years ago. It was wonderful. It was an anti-slavery conference uh, in the Midlands at the NE, uh, NEC, not NEC, it was the, one of the big auditoriums down in Birmingham. Uh, and not only was it speaking about those who were caught in modern slavery in its different forms, uh, bonded work and in the construction in the Middle East, um, those sold into to prostitution from Eastern Europe, uh, those in religious slavery, uh, in in the brothels of India and other places and this went on and on and on and they shared the story of, of slavery and how Christians a lot of the time in the forefront of bringing uh, freedom to these people. I think there's at least 27 million 
people in slavery in our world today. And there were great stories. One stuck in my mind. Two very big burly Indian chaps. Looked like um, Christian bouncers they did. Uh, and they spoke of their story as they raided a religious brothel uh, um, and rescued the women and the children who were uh, stored there uh, for use in the temple. You can't imagine that this stuff happens today, but it still does. They, the, the women and the children from the Dalit caste, the lowest of the low, as it were, uh, and these two big guys sort of smashed the doors down, dragged all the, uh, all the people out and drove them away in waiting vans and minibuses to safety. It was a proper rescue mission. It felt like the A-Team or something like that. And, you know, Christians down the ages have been at the forefront of bringing freedom, freedom movements. Martin Luther King said, The Bible tells the thrilling story of how Moses stood in Pharaoh's court and cried, Let my people go. That echo of the, the slaves in Africa. That he was a forefront of the freedom movement in the 60s. One of the reasons Christians stand for freedom is because God is a God of freedom. We read from the start to the end of the Bible. Free not to do exactly what we want, but free to choose to go God's ways. Free to choose to go God's ways. And we keep on with the story of the Bible and the wonderful themes which we find there in the history of God's people. So we're going through the, the Bible course, we're looking at the themes which are in there. And so Abraham had a son Isaac, and he had a son Jacob, and he had a, a youngest son who's called Joseph. Joseph and his amazing technical and dream court guy. And he becomes eventually, through some tragedies and wonderful uh, coincidences, second in command in Egypt. And he saves the, um, uh, Jacob and the rest of the family from famine when it happens. They grow and multiply in Egypt. Joseph dies and time moves on and they become too prosperous. So the Egyptians start to use them as slaves. And then we come across a chap called Moses. Moses who is miraculously saved as a child uh, and though, Jewish, though Jewish lives in the palace. He ends up in the wilderness after killing a guard there, and God speaks to him through the burning bush many years after he leaves the palace to go back and to challenge Pharaoh. So we're sort of in that sort of creation. We've dropped down into the, uh, the time of slavery and we're trying to get our way out of that time of slavery as well. God is a God of freedom, seeking to bring freedom to his people. You know, the, the Passover is celebrated every year uh, in Jewish culture as a reminder of God delivering his people from slavery. The door frames were marked with the blood of the Passover lamb and the firstborn are saved. And there's not the, the wailing that there was in the rest of Egypt. This is their first steps into freedom. They're released from slavery and go into the promise towards the promised land. And despite Pharaoh having a, another change of mind, and following after them, still God protects them. And the pattern of the Bible is for God to bring his people to freedom. True freedom. We see that freedom has a price of the lamb's blood on the door frames, isn't it? You know, there's no doubt that this theme reoccurs 1400 years later. In fact, Jesus dies on the time of the Passover festival. That's not just a coincidence. It's to show that Jesus fulfills the, the true Passover lamb. The true freedom which comes through him is something which is ours today. The picture from the Old Testament comes into the New Testament which comes to us now. Paul also writes of the sacrifice of Jesus. He says for freedom that Christ has set us free. And as we go and go to the Lord's table, take the bread and the wine, we remember Christ's body and blood broken for us, poured out for us, so that we may be free. We're not under judgment anymore. 
God has taken that upon. Elsewhere, Paul's Christians to say, uh, don't abuse your freedom, but use that freedom to live for God. We're no longer uh, slaves to sin and all the wickedness in the world. Let's choose to follow Jesus. We don't have to justify ourselves before God because he's already justified us. That's what true freedom is all about. That freedom to choose to go God's way. A life lived out in, in response rather than, than fear. And as Moses took the Jewish people out of slavery, in a way that's what God has done for us. We are called to live his ways. First one, God is freedom. Second one, God is with us. You know, it takes a certain character to go to uncharted land where each step we go on our own. It's very rare. Even the bravest of people took local guides with them. Hillary didn't go on his own uh, he had Sherpa Tenzing Torge, didn't he? And they went to the top of Everest together. Even the moon landings were in pairs, weren't they? The people of God, as, as they left slavery, could have felt that they'd been freed, but just left there in the desert or whatever, told to get on with it. But God guided them. He took them by the hand, didn't he? A symbol of this was the fiery, fiery cloud, the fiery pillar by day and the uh, that guided them day and night and they had the Ark of the Covenant later on as well which was another symbol of God being with them as they travelled assuring them of God's presence showing the way both physically and spiritually as well and this is translated into, into present day terms as well God assures us that we are never alone he is with us his presence is with us through his spirit who directs us and leads us and grants us a peace that we could never have from the world. Jesus and Paul speak of the Holy Spirit coming into the hearts of believers through faith and making a difference in their lives. Sometimes directing, sometimes comforting, sometimes challenging, sometimes bringing peace. God is at work in, differently in each believer's heart but also in a similar way as well. I know that I've spoken to folk who've seen the word, uh, the, well, God's spirit directing them in life, change them around. It can be in simple, simple ways, just that, but that sense of peace which God gives us. But it's always for the better, even if it's a challenge sometimes. This could be little nudges that they've responded to in, in life, things that they've heard. What's your devotion to the Lord like? What is it? What, you know, a little nudge which God can give us. Maybe out in the fields and look up and see creation. And it moves our hearts. That's God's spirit at work. Maybe when we're considering doing something that's wrong, God gives us that conscience. We listen, need to listen. Maybe God speaks to us through a friend or a neighbour. A word which is spoken which is changes the direction of our life. One other one of those wonderful themes that God goes with his people. He is with us personally. That's wonderful. Third one, God cares for us. And when we make something or, you know, we have something that we put a lot of effort into, then we want to care for it, don't we? I remember I had a rather beat up bike. It was at the end of it all anyhow. But I got it as a teenager. It was an Eddie Merckx racer, it was. And I turned it into a touring bike. I put pannier racks on it uh, and uh, did the the, go uh, the cogs at the back wheel, the back uh, block there. Uh, I changed that so it had a, a, a big cog so it could get up very steep hills. I painted it. I, I really looked after that bike and it served me very well. I reckon I did tens, tens of thousands of miles on it. Uh, over the years, I called it all faithful. It was a cracking old bike. You know, God has called his people and they travel out of slavery into freedom. He's directing them and he provides for them when they are in the, uh, in the wilderness. You know, God cares for us even through our life. Firstly, he gives them the law, doesn't he? He cares for them by a, a structure 
of, of governing their society, the Ten Commandments, given so that they would live together well. Rules that we still have today, speaking of loving God and loving our neighbour. That's what they are all about, aren't they? If we do these things, there would be very little trouble in the world, would they? He wants the best life for us, for them as a community, and for the world as well. These are his Ten Commandments. And secondly, give them food and water. Remember, as they travelled, they were physically provided for. They got the bread of heaven that fell, and the quail that landed in the uh, camp, and the water that came from the rock. God looked after them as they travelled. You know, as God cares for us as his people, he also provides for us in so many different ways. Not just physical ways, but spiritual ways as well. As we look to Jesus, we think of the, the Sermon on the Mount and, uh, and, and others that back up the law, because they're all based on the Ten Commandments. And he, Jesus tends to put a more positive spin on the thou shalt not, uh, you know, um, you know, you shall not steal. It's a negative thing. We don't do this thing. But a positive spin on that would be to be generous. It swings it the other way. Just not a, a thou shalt not, but be generous. Yes, we don't bear false witness. We don't lie. But we rejoice in the truth. The truth shall set you free, Jesus says. And the list goes on. Jesus takes those rules which care, you know, which care for us. The positive way that God cares for us, both physically and spiritually as well. And finally, God forgives. I asked the priest for forgiveness because I ate a dog today. He said, oh, if I hadn't have done that, I would have suffered eternal Dalmatian. Oh dear. <laughs> to err is human, to forgive is divine. And in the wilderness, God gives the people a means to be forgiven. When they get things wrong, it, it'll be costly for them. But it meant that they were in a right relationship with him again. The restoration was through an animal being sacrificed. The sin of the person or the people were taken away by the death of the animal. A pigeon, a lamb, a bull or a goat. The animal carries the sins of the people away. That's where the English word scapegoat comes from. The goat had all the sins of the people laid upon it. And then they drove it out of the camp as a symbol of the sins being driven out. And as we read the New Testament, the parallels are much too evident, aren't they? John the Baptist sees Jesus. He cries out, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In Jesus, this restoration with a holy and perfect God is done through the sacrifice of himself. God takes the sins of the world in Jesus. He is that perfect sacrifice for us. As we thought about last week, God would restore all things eventually. And through Jesus, it's much more, it's perfected. We don't need the sacrifice of animals because Jesus has been sacrificed for us and borne our sins away. I was reading Isaiah 53 recently, as the ancient prophet foresaw, written 500 years before Jesus, one who would be stricken for everyone and through his personal sacrifice bring forgiveness and peace. To finish, I hope you've seen that there are those really strong themes, reoccurring themes in the Bible as we take that big view, as we look down upon the, uh, the, um, uh, on the Bible and look at the, the scriptures there and see how it all links together. God is a God of freedom. God is a, a God who goes with us. He walks beside us. One who cares for us, spiritually and physically. And also gives us that path of forgiveness as well. Something that we share with the rest of the world. And as we go on, we will see more and more patterns coming together as we think about God of the scriptures. Let me say a prayer. Lord God of the old and of the new, the one who brings true freedom in your will, who brings your presence and care for us, who forgives us through Jesus. Help us to be those who live out your ways in the world.
May our confession of faith and the lives that we live reflect who you are, that great and gracious God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing our next hymn, a wonderful uh, hymn of praise. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Let's come to a time of prayer as we remember the needs of the world, our own personal needs and needs of our community and our friends. Gracious Heavenly Father, God of the whole wide world, we seek your presence in our world at this time, where there is trouble and strife and discord. We pray that you would bring peace and reconciliation. We pray for those countries where there is war and violence, we continue to pray for the troubles in the Ukraine, that an end would come to the war there, that you would protect lives, bring stability to that place again. We pray for uh, problems in Iran at this time. There's this much talk of, of violence going on and the troubles in that country. We pray a godly and freedom-loving um, Revolution would come to that place, Lord God. Pray for other places in the world where there is tension. Israel and Palestine. The problems with the gas link in, in northern, uh, in the Baltic, between Russia and Europe. And other problems, Lord God. Pray, God, that you would bring peace to our world. Pray for those suffering after um, natural disasters, the hurricane in Florida and parts of the Caribbean, other problems in the world, Lord God, where there is drought, or flooding, or lack of food, or we pray, Lord God, that you would strengthen the arm of those seeking to bring humanitarian aid to these places. Lord, we lift them to you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Pray for our own nation, remembering our King, King Charles, and we pray also for uh, his family as they continue to adjust to the new life without our Queen. Strengthen them, we pray. May they have good and godly and wise counsel in all their deliberations. Show them your paths, we pray. Pray for our nation as well, as we seem to be going through times of 
of trouble again. Strengthen those in leadership, our Prime Minister, for those seeking to bring economic stability. Help, Lord God, our nation. We pray also for those uh, affecting the minds of our country, those in the media, newspapers, those involved in television and film production. Heavenly Father, we pray that they would choose godly and good ways to serve our nation. Bless them, we pray. We pray that the ways of our country will be your ways of, of righteousness and mercy and goodness and peace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We lift to the Lord those known to ourselves who need his special touch at this time. A moment of silence. We bring to the Lord those we know who need his healing or reconciling touch. Gracious God, for those we've named in our hearts, we pray you will draw close to them. Bless them mightily, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. We pray for ourselves that we would be those who seek to show your character in the world, Lord God. You are that God of freedom, the God of truth, the God of, of uh, forgiveness, the God of sacrifice. Lord, Bless us. May we demonstrate by our words and our deeds who you are. Lord, if we are downhearted, we pray that you would lift us up. If we pray that we are rejoicing, we pray that you would um, help us rejoice and be grateful. All these things, Lord God, we pray for your mighty hand to be at work in our lives, in our church's life, in the life of our community. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we say the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord grant you his peace this day and forever. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to join together in our final hymn, uh, a great hymn of praise again. God is our strength and refuge. 